Well, greetings, everybody. Welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. As always, our official sponsor is Running Aces Racetrack Casino and Hotel. And our other sponsors are Learn Pro Poker website and, and the small, small business community. In this chats edition of the podcast, we're actually going to be sharing with you part of our seminar from June. Uh, if you are a premium member at Rec.Poker, you know that every month we do these seminars uh, for our members. Uh, people can engage in the conversation. We do a whole bunch of stuff, uh, but we thought it'd be fun to actually spend one of our episodes sharing just a sample from our seminar on 3-betting. So that is what this is going to be all about today. Uh, my name is Steve Fredlin, and I'm the host of the Rec Poker Podcast, and normally we have a panel, uh, but today you'll just hear a little bit from Chris Jones as he introduces uh, the, the seminar. Uh, Chris is our director of content. You'll also hear a little bit from John Somsky later on about the winners in the, in the home games, but make sure you stay tuned for that because John is going to go over why it is so important that you register your Poker Stars alias on your Rec Poker account. You don't need to be a paid member, but you do need a free Rec Poker membership, uh, and you put your Poker Stars alias out there. If you don't do that, you are not going to be allowed into the Poker Stars home games uh, if you're not already a member. And uh, if you are an existing home game club member, you are going to be suspended as of January 1st unless you do that. Uh, we need that to be done uh, because that is how we're going to build community. That's how we're going to uh, aggregate results. There's a whole bunch of reasons to do it. Uh, but so go out to rec.poker, get your free membership, and in your profile, in your extended profile, put your username for PokerStars out there. That'll take care of it. All right. So listen to John later on in, in the show. And uh, for now, uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Chris Jones. And he's going to take it from here. Well, welcome, everyone. This is uh, Chris Jones, 5 by 5 on Poker Stars and Twitter. And um, today, we're for the podcast, we're going to kind of do a behind-the-scenes look at one of our seminars. Um, every month, uh, Rec Poker for premium members puts out uh, a seminar based on member input uh, for a, a topic each month. Um, and we've already covered, uh, through the past year, we've already covered... Uh, we started off doing uh, kind of a run-up to what was at the time a run-up towards trying to play in the World Series of Poker. Obviously, uh, life changed that, but we still uh, think it's a really good run-up for content. So we started off doing uh, a back-to-basics thing with Poker Math. Uh, then we had a, a seminar on opponent ranging, uh, then on bet sizing, then on playing multi-field, multi-table tournaments. Um, in June, we did a seminar, which is the one you're going to hear some highlights today on three betting uh, and how we all need to sort of find ways in our game to um, both uh, establish and, and, and expand our three betting ranges. Uh, we've, and then we carried on into July. We did a, a seminar on bluffing. Uh, and on the flip side, in August, we did a seminar on obtaining and getting value. Um, we did one on big blind play, uh, playing multi-way, the mental game, and the one upcoming for December is going to be on playing draws. Uh, and then in the coming uh, year, in 2021, we've already got our, our next six planned. We're going to be doing, in January, it's going to be all about tells and reads. In February, we're going to be talking about board texture. Uh, in March, we're going to be talking about betting patterns and how to uh, look at the ways uh, betting patterns, what they mean, how to play them, uh, what they often uh, can tell you about opponent ranging and that kind of thing. Um, in in April, we're going to be talking about uh, a later, later hand play, so turn and river play. Um, and then in May, we're going to be talking about finding this one. I'm really excited about, we're going to be talking about finding leaks, uh, self-analysis, how to sort of like understand what you're doing wrong and, and how you can improve it uh, and how you can take those sort of moments of self-reflection. And then uh, in June, we're going to cover satellites. So those are kind of the, the upcoming ones and the ones we've already done. All premier members have access to all of those. Uh, what you're going to hear here is about uh, 20, 25 minutes of the panel talking about some three betting uh, tactics and uh, theory. Uh, that seminar goes on uh, to then go into some uh, sort of in-depth hand examples. But we kind of lay each seminar, we kind of lay the groundwork first and then give some concrete examples so that that uh, kind of more theoretical conversation kind of starts to uh, make more sense. So uh, this is going to be that uh, conversation and uh, hope you enjoy it. And I think that actually starts to extend into um, 
kind of the, the rest of the conversation I wanted to have up front. And the way the way we're going to approach um, this seminar is really talking through some of the the theoretical stuff, going through some of the stuff that Lexi talked about, but also some of our own thoughts around it, uh, and then really extending into some real world examples. I think that is the most helpful way to really look at three betting situations. But the first thing that I wanted to talk about was sort of range construction. Um, and the big question about like how often should you three bet is I think the one that is the really first starting point, whether we have a polarized range or a linear range, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, and how you build those and how you develop those. The thing that I think is, is really important to remember, and we can talk about this, but my sort of rule of thumb, and it's kind of nice that it's a three bet and it's 3%, um, is that 3% is a real magic number with uh, three bets. Um, and that is um, when you're playing online, you can have HUDs. When you're playing live, you can look at people and you kind of need to see, are they three betting once every three orbits or not? And you can start counting early on really by counting. This is one of the few things that I kind of have as my own mental HUD when I'm playing live is I try to count how many times people are three betting. Um, and it's because I, I think it's one of the most important factors for determining what kind of opponent you're up against. And if people are only three betting at a kind of a 3% or less clip, obviously they could be card dead. Obviously if they're doing it more, they could always be getting aces. So some, this isn't completely reliable, but over the long haul, if people are playing this way, they're playing really straightforward, honest poker. They're playing, if you look at this, uh, the slide here, this is a range that shows ace queen suited, ace king, jacks plus. It's 3.32% of hands. So if they are only raising, if they're only three betting with this very high end of their range, they're going to be doing it about 3% of the time. And so players who are doing it more are either going, whether they're doing a linear or polarized, they're extending this range. And players who are doing it less are the players who are. Um, are, you can respect their three bets more, but you can also exploit them a bit more by some overfolding and some things like that. Um, so that's that's one way that I really try to measure this. Is I, it's a it's a number that I keep in mind when I'm looking at three bet stats. Sometimes we have these stats and we're not sure what to do with them, but this is I think a really reliable one, one that you can really look at really closely. Uh, and again, in a live game, you can kind of say how many times if if they're not doing it, if they're three betting once every three orbits or or, or less, um, they're they're probably in that kind of more static or reliable stage. But I'm curious about the panel. Um, do you keep track of this? Is this something you're looking for when you're playing both live and online? How do you how do you approach this? I, I pay attention to this a lot, and I, I track it on my HUD automatically because I play mostly online. But to me, it's a very revealing stat about somebody. Um, other than if they're just going card dead or not, especially if they get to showdown, if you get to see some of the holdings that people three bet, that tells you a lot about how they think about the game, what they're trying to accomplish with raises, you know, it tells you what they think about strong play versus weak play. Um, so I definitely track three bets and, and, and I'd always make a note if that goes down to showdown and uh, try and walk back through the hand and see what kind of decisions they made. But even if you don't get to go down to showdown, pay it, I always pay attention to, is it in, is it on the button? Is it coming out of the blinds? Um, you know, different types of three bets that I think add a lot of kind of texture and nuance to your, your strategy and defense. But yeah, I think, I think it's, it's one of the, one of the, one of the most important things to pay attention to pay attention to and, and and it collects pretty quickly because you get it's a pre-flop stat so you, you get to see a yes no value pretty often mm -hmm. yeah i like to look at the uh, three bit stats on my hud because you can tell how the person thinks about the game basically if you've got this really low three bet percentage you know that they're only doing it with the premium hands so you can get a good you get a good feel for whether you should just be getting out of the hand based on what you raised with, right? Because I open pretty wide for the most part. And so when somebody three bets me with one of these ranges, it gives me a really good idea of whether I should continue or not. Um, and 
the other factor that I look at um, when I'm determining if I should uh, three bet somebody myself or react to their three bet is the position in which they did that action. So if somebody opens in the early early position, my three bet range is going to change based on the fact that they open in early position because now their opening range is much tighter. So my three bet range has to be tighter. Now, as we go, you know, as we go further around the table and somebody from middle position opens, I can open my three bet wider yet because of that. So we talked about linear and polarized, but it really has a lot more to do with the openings opener's position before you decide to three bet and then again looking at this type of stat where you have somebody that's only three betting three percent of the time that really opens up my range to what i can open um open the pot with so yeah i think it's very important and you know the the slide title is this how often should you three bet and i think that's a much more open question i think that if you are three betting 3% or less of hands, then you're doing it wrong. But how often we should actually be three betting is really more open to style and some conversation. And I think it's something that, that we can really open up to the conversation. But actually, I'd be curious about uh, some of our own, you know, either our HUD stats or our own sort of maybe even goals. Like, how often do you strive to be three betting or, or should seem to be three betting in your own? in your own kind of play? Uh, for me, it's pretty situationally dependent. Um, I've got, I've, I probably three bet out of the blinds a little more than most people. And uh, uh, maybe actually less on the button because I tend to take a lot of call lines on the button. Um, but I think typically in a tournament, I'm going to be three betting between say like seven and 12%. Um, seven to ten percent depends on depends on uh, depends on the hands, of course. But overall, I should have drilled down and gotten you some positional stats. Dummy. Yeah, I think hey, I was I was paying attention really over the. I'm sorry. I was paying attention sorry. over the weekend sorry, of Ron. what I of what I was doing, and my on my HUD stats. And I couldn't believe how high my three bet percentage was yesterday. <laughs> it was very, very, I mean, I was in the 12% range, which um, I think is pretty, that's a pretty high range or high percentage against the field, I guess, against the population. The population is never going to be that um, three bet, uh, have that kind of three bet percentage. So, um, I I tend to be higher than that three percent, definitely. Yeah, and position plays a lot into that too. Like if you're if you're playing five position, you should be you know changing that percent that you're three betting. And at six max, you're going to be in more prone positions to three bet when you're in position and stuff like that. Yeah, it's for sure situational um, and and definitely by stack and position and all those kinds of things. But um, when I'm looking at my my overall stats over a really long haul of play, I'm I'm usually in that sort of eight eight to nine percent of hands um, that I, that I find myself three betting. Um, sometimes less, sometimes more uh in fact i played this weekend uh in this tournament where everyone was limping and i uh i was raising a lot but uh, you know like the stats can be kind of deceptive too because um i would raise a bunch of limps and then limp calls and limp calls and then i i had like a one percent three bet uh thing over about 250 hands and i was like, what is going on here what am i doing but it was it was really about how everyone else is playing so it's not really like something you can just totally look at but it is something that you should be uh at least aware of about how you're playing um what, what is, so let, may, oh, I, go ahead sorry sorry chris i'm just quick question um i'm eating supper so i'm on <laughs> i'm muting my audio for my video um I'm, I'm curious like what what you guys see and i don't know if you'll get into this or not but the standard range of 
people's three bet frequency. So like when you're playing online and you're looking at these HUDs and you're looking at everybody's stats, like what's kind of the it, it, normal distribution of bell curve, whatever, like what's the general range of people that you have enough hands with to feel like this is a pretty accurate depiction? Is it like most people are between three and 12%, like 95% of people are in that range with boy, most people are at like seven or eight, or is it kind of this, almost a binary thing where it's like, boy, you know what? Most of the people are either three to 5% or they're 10 to 13%. You know what I mean? Like, is it a, is it kind of a bell curve or is it like a polarized sort of deal? I feel like Jim and Taylor probably have really good answers to this. I mean, I, I have some observations, but I, I probably have less experience looking at all the, the data. I'm just going to pull, I'm just going to pull poker tracker up in the background. So go ahead and I'll see if I can come up with any good answers. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I mean, you have different tendencies of different players. I see a wide range. Um, typically, I think somewhere around like seven is average. Uh, I'll see people that have as low of numbers as three, four percent, and some people that are upwards of fifteen. Um, so, I mean, you just get kind of like a a wide array of people that are in there. But I would say it's probably kind of like a normal distribution around seven. I think the people that are at you know three and the people that are at like fifteen are less less common um but it's i mean you have a lot of different player types out there everyone yeah, taking different yeah. approaches to three betting that's what i was trying to take a trying to get like could we draw some inferences from that like either generally people are really played straightforward three betting or they're high frequency but what i'm hearing from you is no it's a pretty it's across the board it's not necessarily a modal sort of thing that's interesting but i i do think there is um there is a player type and it may be even more live than it is online. Although I am noticing in, in some of the, at least the, some of the lower stakes online where um, there is a player type that is not three betting enough where, you know, they're in that like one, two, 3% range or, you know, they're the type of player that sits at the table and is just not three betting unless they have it. They like calling a lot. They like seeing flops. They don't like risking too much with, with, non-premium hands um and one of the reasons i have the the next slide up here the next couple of slides up here is not to suggest that this is anywhere near an ideal three betting range it's nowhere near what um what i tend to three bet with and i'm not you know i'm not suggesting that what i do is ideal but but i am suggesting that if you're finding yourself in that spot where you're only doing this at a very low frequency and only with those sort of jacks plus ace king type hands that this is a s potential place to start like at least start to think about how can i get five percent of my hand and these these are two examples of sort of a a five percent range that maybe is like your baby step into three betting uh when you're not uh when you're not when you've only been doing it traditionally with value is that this is a, the starting of a range where you might be able to like think about dipping your toes into the pool of of three betting with like like a nine eight suited or with a with a with your king queen suited or pocket eights or that kind of thing so um and then this is this is this would be against uh, a late position versus an early position open uh and then um this would be extending it even further to around an eight percent range if we're if we've got a middle to late position open and we're um we're in that late position and we're sort of like figuring out what to do next um this would be a way to extend that even further um so it's not I'm not holding these up as things that you should even strive for. I'm just saying that this is the potential, and I don't know if the panel would even agree with this. This was my shot at like uh if this is uncomfortable for you, this is a good place to maybe start your process. Um I, I don't know what, what anyone else would, would think about these ranges or how you would suggest if somebody has found themselves in that position where they're not three betting enough, how to how to make that that first leap into into trying it. Yeah, I, I love it. I think I think the exact the, the question you should be asking if you're trying to add hands to your three betting range is what are the characteristics of these hands that I want to add? Are they blockers to the nuts? Are they hands that perform well against big pairs when you don't get the fold? Are they hands that are easy to play on the flop like pairs? Um, are they hands that are easy to fold to a four bet? 
Um, so you got to think about what's the kind of game that you play? What's the style? What are the kind of decisions that you want to be making with these different hands? And then think about these different types of hands as like different tools or weapons that you can use in different battles. Um, so uh, there's, no, there's no wrong way to draw these. I think Chris has done a great job getting at the idea that there's different categories of hands you might choose for those three bets because they have different attributes. Jim hit on a lot of good things there and I want to point them out and give them credit. Like a lot of things that are really important here are uh, blockers. Blockers can be really important. Uh, you don't want to be up against aces. So if you have an ace in your hand, it makes it that much less likely that your opponent has aces. Um, so blockers can be a big part. Um, what you do against a four bet, uh, a lot of people don't think about, but is very important. Um, if you take a linear approach, you're going to be putting yourself in weird positions where you don't necessarily know what to do against a four bet. Uh, polar, uh, it weakens your overall three betting range uh, because you're adding a little bit less hand, lesser of hands to your three betting range, but it does make it easier to decide what you're going to do against a four bet. Like, Chris included some hands on here, the nine, eight, seven, eight suited, the weak suited aces. Those are the types of hands that you know what to do when you get four bet and then you have to make a decision. You fold. Uh, when you have king, queen offsuit uh, and you're adding that into your three betting range, all of a sudden now you're kind of in a weak spot where you're, yeah, I mean, I'm 50 50 against jacks and tens, but I'm really in trouble against aces and I'm not really sure what to be doing type of thing. Like that, those are two really important things, the blockers that you have and what are you going to do if you get four bet? I love that. Well, I love that. And that brings up the question that I was going to ask too. I think it leads right into that nicely is, you know, as we're constructing our ranges, um, do you guys have a, a perspective on, we, we want a sort of balanced range for how we react to four bets. So is, is that part of your consideration and sort of how do you split that up to say, okay, this is my three betting range. If I get four bet in, in generalities, I want to be able to go with it X percent of the time and fold it X percent of the time. Like is, is there a generally either a conceptual theoretical or a practical ideal split of those, of these things. So when I say, okay, I've got, these are my value three betting hands I want an offsetting equal amount, different amount of sort of hands that I like the playability of, but I'm willing to fold to a four bet of. Yeah, if you're if you're old school analog like me, you put charts like this together with different sort of hand classes and then different things that you're supposed to do in different situations, depending on what the characteristics of your foe is in that particular spot so you already know as rob was saying earlier you already know what you're going to raise with what you're going to call with what you're going to fold with um you know the the now it's just a question of seeing how the hand plays out um you know so when you're actually going through and designing ranges yeah you should have something you know you're going to push back with something you know you're going to ditch something you know you're going to play in position but fold out of position so that's like the whole fun of poker as far as i'm concerned right but is it yeah i love that i love i can't read sanskrit so i have no idea what you wrote there but like is there a is there sort of a, a split when you when you sit down with your piece of paper and a pencil i guess um and yeah you're writing you're saying okay i'm going i want to generally three bet in this spot, you know, whatever, Jackson better, ace queen suit in better, and ace king off suit, whatever it is. And then you say, okay, well, that's X percent of rain, whatever that is, that's nine, 10% of hands or whatever. Do I then want another 10% that are my, are, are my bluffing hands? Or do I want 5% because I want to be two thirds value heavy? Do I want, you know, do I want 20% because I'm willing to be only one third value? And I know this generalities of blah, 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 but as a starting point for a basic recreational player building a range, how, how even are those scales of justice, I guess? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, Chris, you sound like you've got something prepped for that. Well, I don't know if I'm prepped and I don't know if I'm right, but my approach is to have a little bit more value, but not much. And what I really like to have with the polarized range is I, you know, I'm less worried about because, because I'm polarized, I tend to know what to do with a four bet. But if I'm called with a three bet, I like to have board coverage with my, with my polarized range. So I like to be able to, no matter what the board comes, like be able to have something 
that's possibly good for me, basically. Um, so that's my approach to be slightly value heavy, but not 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 too value heavy. So if it's like, I don't, I don't know what the percentage would break down to. I, yeah. I like that though. I remember that was early on, early way before all you guys this time when I interviewed Mike Schneider. Uh, he introduced me to that topic of of, of, of board coverage. Uh, and I thought that was a fascinating conversation. I, it's fun to hear you bring that back up. I love that idea. Mm-hmm. And the like fun thing about this is there's a bunch of like computer programs and stuff. The, the game theory optimal place, like they have been solved for, you know, each of the variables that they put in there. And there's, there's set answers to these types of questions in terms of, uh, how much value should you have compared to bluffs and what should your bluffs be comprised of type of things. Um, but the thing is like, we're not playing against computers. Like we're not playing against a computer that's just going to plug it into an equation and spit out an answer. We're playing against people. And the majority of us are playing, you know, weekly tournaments or, you know, some of the smaller tournaments at our casinos and, that completely changes what the computer would suggest on doing, right? Because they have different play styles. So um, to each person, it's kind of going to be different in terms of what should we theoretically be three betting with. Uh, but it does help to understand, you know, we should be having, you know, a polar range just from the theory aspect of it. And then we can change that based off of the opponents that we're playing against. Um, I think a lot of computer programs lean towards a polar uh, type of range when they're three betting instead of a lin- linear, uh, just due to the fact of you know how they're breaking up that decision tree of what they do with certain hands. And I think real quick on that too, just I mean I think GTO also assumes that you're going to continue to play GTO on future streets as well. So you know that's part of maybe what Jim said. You, I kind of have to know my game too, like what my limitations are. Am I capable mm-hmm. of? Three betting with this, whatever this range is, and then knowing what the GTO is plays on the next street because all of the GTO strategies are based on these stochastic iterative models running millions of things and coming back and knowing the right decision at every decision point, you know. And so if I don't feel like I'm confident that I can play GTO the rest of the hand, I have to be comfortable with what my balanced range is as well, right? That's part of the deal. So, and then here we are back. Thanks thanks for listening to that. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, uh, all of our seminars um, come sort of start off with some kind of grounding in theory. Then we have some conversation and discussion and then we go through and we really break down some some examples to help that sort of like saturate in uh, and make, make a little bit more concrete sense. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can sign up for a free membership anytime. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a seven day trial uh, and you can preview all of these. Um, even the backlog of these are all available on the Rec Poker archive. So check them out. Uh, we enjoy doing them. Uh, we're always uh, looking for ideas for content as well. So if you have any uh, ideas that you'd like to see uh, covered in an upcoming seminar, uh, let us know. Uh, and uh, with that, thanks for listening. And now it's time for the home game results from November 16th to November 22nd, 2020. So first, a reminder about signing up for home games. In order to join the home game, you must have a free rec.poker account. And on that account, you must fill in the PokerStars username field with the poker your exact PokerStars username. New members will not be approved to the club unless they have this uh, a rec.poker account with their PokerStars username on their profile. And that can be private if you want. You don't have to make it public. Uh, to have your real name announced as a winner, however, then you must have that PokerStars username public on your profile and your first name and last name must be public on the profile. So it's completely up to you. If you just want us to use your PokerStars ID when we announce the winners, that's fine. Or if you'd like to have your real name in there so your friends will actually know that you won, then go ahead and just make those fields public and then we'll use those on the podcast announcements. And a couple of notes you must confirm your email address when you're signing up uh, for Rec.Poker in order to activate your profile. So be sure to check your spam folder for that email. We'll send one out as soon as your account is created, but it's not activated until you click a link 
that's going to be emailed to you. So make sure that you uh, check the email, check your spam folder, check to see if it's in the forms post if you or forms tab if you use Gmail or one of the other tabs. So just make sure you check everywhere for that uh, email because we will be sending one for you. And then on January 1st of 2021, any existing members who are playing the home game are going to have their accounts suspended on Poker Stars. So you won't be able to play in our home game until you have a rec.poker profile, rec profile with your Poker Stars username recorded. And, you know, it's not the end of the world. As soon as you get that done, we'll uh, reapprove you or reactivate your account in the home game club. But if you want to make sure you don't miss out on any of the action, make sure you have that done by January 1st. And I think we still have about 179 players who are at risk of being suspended at the time of this recording. Now onto the home game results. For the international series, Megra 44, Doug Drabeck got his fourth win. And the nightly series, on November 16th, John Lancer, John Bensky, got his third win. On November 17th, Gloves 1010, Colin Anderson got his second nightly, seventh, sorry, seventh nightly series uh, victory. That number is just so big, it, I stumbled over it for a second. That's really excellent feat. Uh, then Illy Chippies, Jill Burke, got her third nightly series victory. Be the Kid, Brian Morey, got his first nightly series victory. Congratulations, Brian. Keto Man 335, Kian Tavali, got his fourth nightly series victory. John Lutze, also known as John Lutze in real life, got his third nightly series victory. And Cash 1016, Kevin Leiter, got his third nightly series victory congratulations to all the winners and tune in for more results next week all right well great stuff thank you john for uh, all of the work you do in the home games thank you chris for all the work in the seminar hope you guys enjoyed that give us some feedback let us know if you kind of liked hearing some of that premium content over the podcast it's a little bit different than how we do things uh thanksgiving week we wanted to give everybody the week off uh from actually doing a podcast and getting a guest and all of that stuff so we decided to piecemeal this together uh, a little bit uh, just to take that week off. But let us know if you liked hearing that content as part of the podcast uh, or if there's anything else that you would like to hear, just let us know. Uh, thanks to our sponsors running Aces Racetrack Casino and Hotel, Website Amp, Learn Pro Poker, and the Small Small Business Community. Uh, and thanks again, Chris, John, everybody that's been involved. Um, and yeah, you guys, the listeners, man, uh, it's so much fun having you guys out there. I get so many great uh, emails and, and texts and direct messages from you guys who are engaged with what we're doing. Appreciate all of the support, all the love. Uh, and I wish all of you guys just a great holiday season as we sort of ramp, uh, ramp up to the end of 2020 and hopefully into a, into a more normal uh, 2021 uh, as we go. But thanks everybody for your love, your support uh, and your community building uh, that you all do. Oh, Hey, quick thing. Uh, hold the date, January 27th. We're doing our first Rec Poker Awards show. It's going to be super fun on Zoom. Be a lot of cool people involved. A lot of awards given out. Uh, a lot of fun moments shared. Uh, I heard there might be some interesting things going on with some singing. I don't know yet. Uh, but anyway, mark your date, January 27th. Uh, we'll be doing that award show. Uh, that is central time, probably 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh, so set your calendar for that, and we will chat with you later. Take care.